So welcome everybody for this week's presentation. It is a mentorship series. We've titled Get a Taste of This Cooking Basics. So a lot of the information you're going to see is probably information you've learned before, but if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So just a short introduction. My name is Christina Leon Guerrero. And I'm Stella on. And um, we are student navigators from Project Pro. Just a little disclaimer, the information presented is based on research we have done ourselves. So we do encourage all of you to do some research yourself and just participate in today's presentation. For our table of contents, first we're going to dive into why is it important to know to cook, some basic things to know in the kitchen, um, some cooking equipment you may need as a beginner. We will also discuss some safety practices, some pathways to consider if you're interested in the culinary field. And then we'll have our guest speaker talk about a great opportunity here in the CMI if you're interested in the culinary field. And then we will have our activity. So let's dive into why is it important to know how to cook. So for our very first point, cooking at home saves money. You know, as college students or, you know, anyone who's on a ship budget, we find ways to efficiently save our money. Um, the thing about this is that as college students or people who are, you know, just busy in general, we tend to lean forward into things that can be convenient for our schedule and where we can just grab something and go, which is why we go to like fast food restaurants or any restaurant in general, right? Um, the thing about this is that we need to consider we're not only spending money on food, we're spending money on gas which we know now is expensive nowadays and yeah we're just also taking time out of our day to kind of just drive to these places right or even if you do something like it's easy we are spending extra money to just get that delivered to where we're at our second point is health as well so obviously when we know how to cook we are in control of what goes in our body when we know we need to cut down on some salt or sugar or oil we can have better control when we know how to cook our own meals. And we are also able to incorporate healthy food into our diet. Third is that learning how to cook does boost our self-esteem. And you know, I don't know any person who's told someone they, they know how to cook and they just like, you know, look down on me, right? It's something that, it's a skill that people really look high upon because it brings people together. And not everyone is a good cook, but you could possibly be with practice. And lastly, you are what you eat. So I want you guys to think for a moment, right? What are the main causes of death in the CMI? Without looking at the data. Okay. Diabetes, right? What else? Dialysis. Dialysis, okay. Yes, heart issues, right? So things like non-communicable non -communicable diseases, diseases that we have brought on to ourselves because of our poor choices and diet and our lack of physical activity. You know, we can refrain from these things, but it's kind of hard because we were instilled into that, that culture where we can't leave the table until we're done eating or whatever's put on the table, we have to eat it, right? So we just need to keep in mind that when we're eating things with so much salt and sugar and produce fats, you know, these are not healthy for our diet. And when we're going to eat an unhealthy diet, we're going to expect unwanted circumstances for ourselves. Okay, so now some basics in the kitchen. So some basic things to know is just, you know, know how to use a knife, obviously, safely and appropriately. We want to know how to cut and double recipes. So when we're cutting, we're obviously making less proportions for when we're going to make for maybe one or two people. And then when we're doubling recipes, we're going to double the proportion to make more big batch meals and that we can use for meal prep later. And I'm pretty sure we're familiar with picking vegetables and fruit. And then we also want to know different methods of cooking. So there's boiling, simmering, poaching, baking, and there's so much more that you can apply into your meals in the kitchen. So here we have two videos, one on knife skills, and then we have another one on the four cooking yeah. meals. The first cutting technique I'm going to show you is the crust. Can everyone hear it? I'm going to start by using the pinch grip to hold the knife. And then with the other hand, place it right on top of the knife. Keeping the tip of the knife down, we're going to rock back and forth. 
using your other hand more as of a guide. You don't want to apply any weight and cross over your ingredients like I'm doing here with the parsley. And you can start off slow and then slowly speed up and chop over your ingredients. What's great about this cutting technique is that it's very safe. You're keeping your fingers out of the way. It's on top of the knife. So this is a great cutting technique for any sort of rough chops, but perfect for herbs like this. The other cutting technique I'm gonna show you is called the rock chop. We're gonna use a similar pinch grip to hold the knife and a similar rocking motion, just making sure again, to keep the tip of the knife down on the cutting board. And we're gonna rock with that knife hand. Now with the other hand, what we wanna do is hold the ingredient. We're gonna use our fingertips to face the knife and then slowly curl them in. And with that loose thumb, we're gonna tuck it in underneath. Your control hand should resemble a claw, much like this. And with this claw grip, we can actually push the ingredient slowly into the cutting motion of the knife. Now you wanna make sure as you lift the knife that it rests up against your knuckles and never lifts higher. That way you can avoid uh, cutting yourself. So you're gonna slowly move it into the knife and that's it, perfect. Now the only way you're gonna get better is by practicing those cutting techniques. So make sure that your cutting board and ingredients are stable and that you're... Okay, so those are the two cutting techniques that we learned. So there's the rock chop and then there's the cross chop. So now we're going to watch the four cooking methods. Four of the most common cooking methods explain grilling. If a recipe calls for something to be grilled, it generally means it should be cooked over an open flame or heat. Grilling can be done by charcoal or gas on a barbecue, for example, or it could be done using a grill of some sort on the burners of your stove. 2. Broiling Broiling indicates cooking by exposing directly to a heat source such as a flame or element. Most ovens have a broiled setting which heats an element at the top of the stove rather than the one at the bottom, which is used for baking. When broiling items in the oven, they should normally be placed on the top rack to give them the proper heat exposure. 3. Frying versus Deep Frying Both frying and deep frying cook foods with a similar process, but the method is a little different in each case. Frying could be done over any heat source, such as a stove element or an open flame. Oil or butter is heated and the food is cooked by its heat. Deep frying, on the other hand, also involves oil, but in this case the food is completely submerged in the oil. Deep frying is used for foods such as French fries, breaded chicken and donuts. It can be dangerous, however, because you're dealing with boiling oil, so proper equipment and safety precautions must be used. 4. Sautéing Sautéing involved cooking food quickly in a small amount of fat. It is similar in process to frying, but because of the smaller amount of fat and faster cooking times, it brings out stronger flavors than frying will. Knowing what is involved with the various terms will make it easier to plan when following a recipe. You'll know what equipment and ingredients you'll need that are unique to each method. Thank you for watching. Okay, so those were the four cooking methods. Okay. Um, now picking fruits and vegetables. Of course, you want to get produce that have good shape, texture, color, and smell, right? And then you're going to ask me, Christine, how is it supposed to smell? Well, you're going to know when something's not ready to eat or something's not meant to be edible, right? So we want to also shop for produce often and buy only what we will use within a few days. A lot of times we go grocery shopping and then we just end up buying, you know, produce for the whole week. And most times the produce ends up in the trash because we just end up not using it for a meal. So a better way to save money is we just go to the store every now and then and get what we need. And of course, we want to refrigerate or pack of ice our pre-cut or pre-packaged fruits and vegetables. So for some cooking equipment, of course, you want to have a cutting board with a chef's knife, which is kind of like an all-purpose knife. And then we also need some mixing bowls, measuring cups and spoons, 
some wooden spoons and some pots and pans. So now we'll be moving on to different safety practices you can do in the kitchen. When you're selecting meat, make sure to avoid any kind of beef or pork that has a dark brown or discolored color. Um, if it has a strong odor or feels tough or slimy. The same goes with poultry, which includes chicken, turkey, duck, etc. If it has a faded color, a strong odor, or a tough or slimy texture, avoid it. And of course, if the packaging is damaged or leak, leaking or torn, it's likely to be, have been exposed to bacteria in the air, so avoid those too. Some cooking and preparation safety. Always keep your fresh meat and meat juice away from other foods, especially if it's already cooked. Don't put them on the same platter or plate or board because they can cause contamination. So here are some proper ways to store your meat. Raw meat generally lasts safely for about three days in the refrigerator. So if you're planning to keep it longer than that, freeze it. To properly freeze it, put it in an airtight packaging, and then it can be stored for about several months. Um, safe freezing and refrigerator time also depends on your storage temperature. So your freezer should stay as close to zero degrees Fahrenheit, or if you're a Celsius person, negative 17.8 degrees Celsius. And your refrigerator should stay at about 34 degrees Fahrenheit, which is just above freezing, so that you can prolong the shelf life of your food. When properly stored, steak can be stored in your freezer for up to six to 12 months, chicken up to nine months, pork four to six months, lean fish six to eight months, and fatty fish two to three months. Okay, let's say, for example, um, you forgot to thaw something for dinner. So you just grab a meat or chicken packaging from your freezer and you just thaw it in hot water to make it quick. Or what if you did remember to thaw something but you left it on the counter and then you went to work the whole day. Both of these situations would be very, very unsafe and they can cause foodborne illnesses if you eat it like that. So perishable foods should never be left on the counter or in hot water to, when you're thawing it, um, or it should be not be left in room temperature for more than two hours. The proper way to thaw food would be in the refrigerator, in a bowl of cold water, or in the microwave. And this is because once it reaches 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, it can be considered to be in the danger zone. So the bacteria that was there before it froze, it can start to melt and then it will um, start multiplying. So always uh, thaw it properly. So when you're cooking meat, we have different kinds of meat. Your poultry should never be eaten rare. So always cook it thoroughly so that, because it can happen cause salmonella or other diseases, that's very safe. Ground meats, including beef or pork or any kind of ground meat, um, they must also be cooked thoroughly at a high temperature, preferably 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, pork and beef, these kinds of uh, whole meats, these should always be left at about three minutes of rest after you finish cooking them so that the heat has extra time to kill any bacteria that you might have. Uh, pork, always cook them at a high end of your medium. It can potentially carry dangerous worms or parasites. And with beef, beef is a little safer. I know there's people that like rare meat, beef, but it's always safer to stick to steaks or roasts or chops. To practice sanitation, it's best to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and running water. Keep your food waste in a closed bin, sanitize your area after doing each procedure, and wash your fruits, vegetables, and equipment properly. So here are some pathways to consider if you're interested in the culinary field. There are different, um, most chefs have a high school diploma. They are mostly studying in culinary arts, hospitality management, and related studies or culinary management. If you decide to become a hospitality chef, you have the options of working at hotels, resorts, or cruise ships. Um, and a lot of chefs who decide to take a bachelor in science and culinary arts degrees, they have a wider variety of cho cho sorry, to choose from, including culinary education, food compliance and safety, or production management. And of course, we also have the NM Tech, 
or also commonly known before as NMTI, um, certification under the Culinary Arts Program. To give a little information about this, this is a four-month process, including a 240-hour internship. So you can go to different industries on island, get hands-on experience, and based on your work ethics, or if you do well, you can actually continue working there or even as an intern. Okay, so now we're going to introduce our very handsome guest speaker. <laughs> he is a graduate of the Le Cordon Blue College of Culinary Arts in Las Vegas. Um, he's worked at Hyatt Regency, Triple J. He is working right now at NME Tech. And he is the owner of Kevin Gelati Stone and Bistro Boy. He's been awarded for the Siphon Chamber of Commerce 2021 Startup Business of the Year, Siphon Tribune Business of the Year, and the High Star of the Year 2011. So can we please give a warm welcome to Mr. Babauta. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you guys for having me. Thank you to the Team ProA and um, the Navigators for having me and having this awesome event. I thought the presentation was very thorough. Uh, everything we teach at NM Tech revolves somewhat around that. So good job, girls. And I hope you guys learned something new. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about my journey uh, from high school uh, until today. So I was born and raised here in Saipan. I went to Mount Carmel. Um, and in my senior year, I got accepted to Shamanad University in Hawaii and University of Guam. Um, but in March, before we graduated, my sister said, why don't you go to culinary school? And I was like, what? <laughs> no. So um, we did it anyway. So we applied for uh, Licor and Blue College of Culinary Arts in Las Vegas. And a week later, I got accepted. So we totally moved our plans from Hawaii to Las Vegas. And my dad was like, no more changing plans. This is it. Um, as you guys know, college is expensive. Um, science my hair, NMC is very important. Um, but I went to um, culinary school and I kind of cheated. So I got an associate's degree in a year and a half. Um, actually less than that, in 15 months versus, uh, so if you want to get your degree fast, you should go to a trade school. Uh, <laughs> So I did a uh, record on blue, but it, because I had an associate degree, I did have to take English, math, communication, politics, all of the, um, all of the, the cl lecture classes. But on top of that, we did take classes for cooking. So we had sanitation class, wine and beverage, cuisine across cultures, new trends, baking and pastry. So that was all of my, um, all of our classes that we took at record on. So me moving all the way to Las Vegas, I had to finish my degree. And part of that is we had to do an internship as well. So I secured an internship here at Higher Regency Siphon actually before I left the culinary school. Um, so a year later, after I took all the classes, I moved back here and did an internship at Higher Regency Siphon. And like was mentioned in the uh, presentation earlier, because of my skills and good work ethic, I was hired as a cook at Hyatt Regency Saipan. Um, so I worked, have you guys eaten at Hyatt Regency Saipan? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so I worked at Kili Cafe, which is the buffet restaurant. Um, I worked there, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and then they saw my potential. So I underwent a management training program from Hyatt. Um, and that is where I really, can I take off my mask, is that okay? Yeah. I will yeah. step back. Um, so from that, I really uh, did training and I went through all the restaurants. I worked at Giovanni's, uh, Italian restaurant, uh, Teppanyaki, Japanese restaurant, Miyako, Japanese restaurant. Uh, I was the butcher. I also worked in purchasing and, market, uh, purchasing and materials where we receive all the products from the different vendors on island. Um, and then I also worked at Regency and uh, Splash Bar, which is the poolside restaurant. So that really put me on the fast track and I did all these projects, all these events, everything like that. And then I got promoted to a chef -y party, which is a supervisor level. So I was in charge of Kili Cafe, uh, Cold Line, which where we did all the salads, soups, appetizers, sandwiches, um, and, and uh, uh, special appetizers. 
um, and marinade salad. So like the chicken calligrin, the coco, all of that. Um, I took care of that. And then a year and a half later, a sous chef position opened up at the Hyatt and I applied and I got it. So then my role transitioned from Kidney Cafe. Now I had to handle four smaller departments. The smaller departments include Regency, which is the VIP lounge, Sandcastle, which is the magic show, DJ's Corner, which is the grab and go, and Splash, which is the poolside restaurant. So I kind of had all these small little outlets to manage, maintain, manpower, and train. And then another, uh, so I was, I was at that for about another year and a half, and then a position in pastry opened up. So I transitioned into pastry. Have you guys tried the Hyatt cheesecake? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah, that was me. That was, <laughs> <laughs> I took care of that for a little bit. That's like Hyatt's signature, right? So I moved into pastry and that actually helped me at my overall goal was to become an executive chef was I wanted to be the executive chef that had a little bit of background and everything. That's why I chose to step out of my comfort zone and move into pastry. And when I moved into pastry, I gained like 60 pounds. No sure. Uh, so if you don't want to, if you want to lose weight, don't go, don't work at any pastry. Um, yeah, so I, I moved into pastry and we really did a lot. Uh, we hustled for all the restaurants. Um, I created some new desserts. Uh, some of them are still serving now at the Hyatt. And um, two years later, I got an uh, offer from Triple J to become the executive chef of Bubblegum Shrimp. So I was debating if I was going to do it or not, and that was my end goal, so I jumped. Um, I moved into Triple J as the executive chef of Bubblegum Shrimp at the age of 25. Uh, that's very young. I was kind of in shock. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, by the culinary standards, that is very young to become an executive chef. Um, but I did it on Saipan. There wasn't really a lot of competition, um, but also I believed in myself to do that. The reason why I wanted to move to the uh, bubble dump is I wanted to see if I was good as, as I thought I was, if I managed uh, the kitchen well, if I could handle the food costs, if I could handle the labor costs, uh, if I could hire train people and run the operation uh, by myself under me. I would accept any fall that came to me anything like uh, any doubts, any, um, not necessarily regrets, but any trouble I would be responsible for. And I was ready for that position. Um, so I worked at Bubblegum for about two years and then I moved into um, Great Harvest and Surf Club. So I handled those two to give them a little bit more help uh, to refine everything. Um, and then I touched a little bit of Tony Robbins and Caprice also, but because they're franchises, um, I didn't really have to touch them too much. Uh, so I really worked at uh, Surf Club and Great Harvest. And then in last year, um, we I opened up the uh, Bar K in Sinian. So that is a Triple J restaurant. And we I, I imagine planning for opening a restaurant in a different island. That's crazy. So we had to like ship all the materials, ship all the food, go there and do the layout, hire people, train people. <laughs> I'm doing it all kind of remotely. So I took trips to Tinian uh, left and right, maybe a couple of times a week, uh, but we still had our duties here on Saipan. And unfortunately, due to the pandemic, um, in 2000, last year, May, 2021, sorry, last year, March, I was let go uh, from Triple J, I was laid off. Um, you know, like we know during the pandemic, a lot of people got laid off, a lot of people um, lost their jobs. Uh, and I was one of them affected, but I didn't let that stop me. So I opened up my own company called Thailand Stellari Stone in June, 2021. So thank you. <laughs> it took me about three months to get everything up and running. Um, a lot of people asked me why I wanted to open an ice cream shop. And I said, why not? Everybody loves ice cream. <laughs> um, and it's like growing up, I would always go to the ice cream shop, Big Dipper, Subway, McDonald's to get ice cream. Um, I just have a big sweet tooth for ice cream. Uh, so opening up an ice cream shop wasn't far fetched from my idea. Um, and in 2021, using Thailand Gelati Stone, we made a lot of money. We made a lot of, um, we met a lot of people and I wanted to use this platform for something that was meaningful for me. So the first thing we did was, um, I have a son and he is autistic. 
So the first thing we did was donate to the Autism Society of the CNMI. Um, and then, so what we did was we sold every gelato and every gelato we gave for one month, we gave a dollar to the Autism Society of the CNMI. Um, and we fundraised 1,500 for the Autism Society of CNMI. And then um, what I also wanted to do was support my other friends that were also opening businesses. So we started this thing called Small Business Sunday. And because I had a location and a park kind of to my advantage, we used it as a way for small businesses to come down to pop up for about three hours. Uh, everybody could kind of meet each other. And then I would use my platform to invite more people to support my friends opening small businesses as well. So it really, they came to me and I pushed them to the side uh, for my friends to get businesses. Um, and it really worked out. We do, there is a small business community going on. Um, there's been pop-ups here at uh, Mango Six, and I think one more at um, like the Kaiman Community Center a couple months ago. Um, but yeah, that thing has really been going and support local, support small businesses. And then next month, uh, we are in the final stages of opening our new restaurant called Bistro Boys. Uh, it's gonna be down the street here at the former Me Cafe. Uh, so next month, be ready for some new food. <laughs> this one, I partnered with my old chef partners. Um, there's a total of four of us. That's why we're called Bistro Boys, because so there's four boys. I used to work with them at Hyatt and at Triple J. Um, and now I'm just starting my new adventure as uh, opening businesses and helping people. And it really helped a lot of people over the span. Uh, but this whole thing sums up because of NMTI. In 2015, I was approached to help recreate the NMTI program for culinary arts. And that is, I would say, one of my passions because I really want to use what I learned from the Cordon Bleu as a local boy to give back to the community, to teach the people uh, the proper way to cook, the proper way to clean, the proper way for sanitation. And uh, going to a culinary school is great if, we, if people have the opportunity and the financial um, things to do it. But also going to NMTI is even greater because it is made up of three different chefs coming from different culinary schools, all local, coming back to create this program in which we think it's the best to work for the CNMI. So NMTech has, um, yeah, so we all teach uh, different classes and we alternate, um, but we know what the trends are here. We know the lifestyle, we know the culture, we know what works. So we edit the program to specifically fit the CNMI culture and what could be advanced and help the people of the CNMI learn and grow and um, for the culinary industry. Yeah, so that just kind of sums up everything I've been doing for the past 10 years or so. Um, I look forward to doing a lot more in the future. Um, I'm still at NM Tech and I really want to grow that. Uh, I did get a lot of job offers left and right from different companies, but it really, it really means that you want to know what you want to do and execute it properly. Because if you don't have that passion and you kind of just do like half ass, it's not really going to get you anywhere. So stick to your gut. You've got to know what you want to do, what you want to do in your future. Is it going to help you today for your goals for tomorrow? So that's something to think about because all of you guys are young now. Uh, I didn't always know what I wanted to do, but as I grew and, um, and learned and had some experiences, I knew which way I wanted to do and I, which way I didn't want to do. So yeah, now I guess that's about it. And I can open up for any questions. Out of all your achievements, which one do you remember? I think opening up Tyler's Gelati Stone. Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. So Tyler is the name of my son. And gelato is the product, which means uh, Italian ice cream. And then Ladi Stone from our local. So combined, it would be Gelati Stone for gelato and Ladi Stone. That is the history behind the name. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, so I was kind of doing gelato like on the side, but because being an executive chef is very demanding and it took up a lot of my time, I couldn't necessarily open up a business business. So no, if I wasn't laid off, I don't think I would have done Tyler's Gelati Stone last year. Very good question. Yeah.
support um, the company has also supported other nonprofits. Yes. So we did other nonprofits, including um, actually yesterday was our final drop off for DYS. Uh, Tales Gelariso donated 100 gelato cups to the kids at DYS uh, over the past four months. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then we also did another fundraiser for, forgive me, Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence <laughs> Awareness. Thing. <laughs> 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 that so long. But yeah, so like we said, using the platform to really do what you want to do and give back to the community and something that's um, meaningful to you is good. Uh, so if you guys start your own business, you guys get your own platform, it doesn't even need to be a business. If you guys are verified on TikTok or Twitter <laughs> or something, I don't know, but go for a user platform for something good and meaningful uh, for you guys. Go ahead, any other questions? Yes. I know like you mentioned about like, you know, startups, like how you were helping with that stuff for small businesses. Yeah. Like from your personal experience, like how financially successful are like these small startups, like especially in the scene? So right now, because we're kind of in the pandemic still, it was very hard for people to start up the business. Very hard for myself to start up the business, which is why I wanted to help everybody grow. Um, for the financial part, um, I recommend people start their business on Instagram shops or TikToks um, because getting opening a shop becomes really pricey. I want to say it takes over $10,000 because you got to pay for rent, apply for a CUC, uh, get zoning, wait a couple months, apply, pay. Uh, you also have accounting. You have to pay your taxes, your W-2, your employees, if you have any employees. Get all your inventory, buy all the products, go marketing, produce your stickers. It's really, really a lot. So I can go on and on about that. But that's why I know opening one was hard. That's why I want to help people open. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so because my location is inside Sugar King Park, um, I'm one of the concessions out of the eight. And because we're all food products, I tried not to get any restaurants. Uh, we did do desserts because it won't necessarily uh, compete with my neighbors. So it was all everything else except food. So desserts were okay. Uh, we did cookies. There was some arts and crafts. Uh, nanny girl nails were the nails. Everything beauty, um, stationaries, balloons, um, a bunch of different businesses. Yeah. Yes. So we actually did Friday a Caesar and Carbonara night for a women's month. Um, so Chef Inas, the full-time uh, chef at Empec and myself, we hosted a Caesar and Carbonara night for the ladies. So we kind of put everything up and then we had, we taught them how to make a simple Carbonara. They made it themselves or we demoed and they made it themselves at the eight. And then we did a Carbonara where we also taught them how to cook the noodles, cook the sauce, tell them some tips and tricks. Um, and then they did it. So we are kind of looking at that for the summer for kind of like a mini course, uh, maybe about a four week, and then we'll do different courses. Like, you know, sushi one day, carbonara one day, a Mexican food the other day, or yeah, stuff like that. So it's in the works and Caesar Carbonara was kind of our test run to see the reactions and maybe the logistics of it. Yes. Um, that really depends on the enrollment. Uh, we do, we can offer classes in the morning and the night, but because this specific class, everybody was available for an afternoon class, we did all afternoon classes. Um, yeah, so in August, we're actually expanding our program. So the class we're running right now would be the last program, but next, in August, our next cycle would be very expanded. It'll be two semesters versus one, and we're gonna touch more into detail and more hands-on and get uh, really the full learning experience for that. And we are also just initially very, very infancy stage. 
doing bake, starting baking and pastry for mm -hmm. an effect. Yeah, so we're, we spoke to Herman's Bakery and then we're kind of looking at materials and how we can run the classes. Yeah, we've had a lot of uh, excitement for <laughs> baking and pastry. And the afternoon at the time, right? Uh, the afternoon, it really depends on the people, but we usually run three to seven, and then the mornings are nine to one. Yeah. Yes. I know I just shared the public school for Johnny's question. What would you say is your favorite My favorite to eat? Yeah. My favorite to eat. That's a hard question. <laughs> it seems easy, but it's really hard. Um, <laughs> My favorite to eat. Actually, I know. <laughs> Chef Inas, my counterpart, he makes a really, really good um, tuna melt sandwich. So he does the tuna. I don't know what the hell he puts in it. But it's good. <laughs> and we have a, 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 a toasted um, sourdough bread. And then he has like melted Swiss cheese and lettuce. And he, I don't know, he concocts some type of mayo. But that's good. So my <laughs> favorite is whenever Chef Inas is cooking. Yeah. We have a question. Okay. Yeah. What is the safest uh, way to uh, properly thaw uh, food, frozen food? Safest way to properly thaw frozen food. Yeah. Okay, so the safest way to properly thaw frozen food is the three ways. The first way is from, can you hear me? Can they hear yes. Me? yes. Okay. So the first way is to move it from your freezer into your refrigerator. And you need to be smart about planning what you need for dinner or lunch the next day. You can either do it the day before or in the morning. The second way is to run it under cold running water. Um, like we said in the presentation, no hot water. And the last one is in the microwave, but only if you're gonna cook it right away. Okay, so yeah, if you forget, you wanna put it in the microwave and then run it straight to your cooking. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? How do you properly store like inside the refrigerator? Like, you know how it is? Um, for fish, like storing it in a container, is it inside? Where do I store it? Is it under where the shelf is or on top? Okay, so her question was, how do we properly store stuff in a refrigerator? Um, at home, really, uh, you guys can do whatever you want, but if you're working in the food industry as a commercial kitchen, the proper way to store it is you want to have at the very top ready to eat food. So if a potato salad is ready to eat, if a sandwich is ready to eat, if your sliced watermelons are ready to eat, it'll be on the top. The second one would be any dairy products or vegetables that are raw. After that would be any seafood um, products and then beef and pork and then at the very bottom chicken. As you saw, you don't want to eat chicken raw. So what happens is if the juices, if the fish juice falls onto the pork, it will cook off because fish cooks at 135 degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit and the pork would cook at 145 degrees. So whatever bacteria was in the fish, it will cook off in the pork. And whatever is in the pork will cook off in the chicken because it cooks to 165 degrees. So that's the proper way to store it. If you had it reversed, you would have the chicken juice fell on top of the fish, you would have to cook the fish to 165 degrees. But at that point, it would be very dry, uh, very small. It'll stick to the pan and not be a good product. So in order to prevent that, you want to rotate it. So ready to eat foods, dairy, vegetables, and fruits, and then seafood, fish, uh, beef, and pork, and then chicken all the way to the bottom. Okay, does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, so all of this will be taught at NMDEC. And I'm nodding my head like I know what you're talking about. I can explain more if you guys like. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Um, so I can tell you the classes now because we have not come up with the final class for our expanded program. So our semester classes are $3,975, but that would include a full chef uniform, a knife kit, 
um, and then all the food that you will be using for the class and stuff like that. But we do accept scholarship from CNMI and Tesla, so that will help. So that concludes the end of our presentation.